Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this webinar from the European Space Agency. Uh, this morning, we'll be talking about uh, space and 5G convergence and the particular focus on the implications that that has for transport and logistics, which we at least think is going to be one of the, uh, the main areas of use case, which is, which is going to drive this. Um, and I just uh, do a little housekeeping before we uh, get going with the webinar, as you'll see in the, uh, the chat bar from, from Skype. Um, we would like to use that. Please do collect your uh, your questions, your comments as we as we go through, uh, and we'll we'll pause periodically when we have a moment, and uh, I'll uh, pass some of those questions to our, our speakers. But we also have uh, set aside a significant amount of time at the end of the webinar uh, to allow us time for some question and answer. Um, we're scheduled for ninety minutes. Uh, during that time, we will uh, uh, have a series of speakers who will set the stage for this and give their expert uh, expert uh, perspectives on it, which I hope you all find helpful and instructive and interesting. Um, and then we will lead in then towards the uh, the call for proposals, uh, which is uh, now launching. Uh, this is between ESA, working with European Space Agency and the uh, and DCMS. We planned this together. Um, and we invite proposals from industry um, for your ideas towards uh, 5G and space uh, integration towards these uh, these applications, um, and that will lead to uh, projects which are which are part funded by ESA and uh, where we invite you to participate. So that's what we're working towards. Um, okay, let's get started then. So I'll introduce myself first. So I'm uh, Nick Appleyard. Hello, if I could have my slide. Uh, that's me. You see, you see me on the video. You can make the comparison. Um, so I head the space solutions department at, uh, at ESA. Uh, that's really to make sure that there is always a demand side when we're investing in space assets, to make sure that there are customers um, and that there is a, a business opportunity attached to, to what we're doing. And in 5G, uh, we see really many, uh, many of these opportunities coming together as long as we're targeting the right, uh, the right use cases and the right customer groups. Um, I'll have plenty of opportunity to uh, use my five minutes, so I'll spread it through the next 90. Um, so I won't uh, speak at length at this point. Um, but I'd like to please uh, invite our first, uh, our first speaker to get us going, um, which is uh, which is Magali Viesier. Now, Magali is uh, our Director of Telecommunications and Integrated Applications uh, at ESA. Um, and within the, uh, the programs in that area, the ARTES program, we have a strategic program line, which is specifically targeted at uh, 5G. Um, so, Magali, I'd like to ask you, and uh, maybe you tell us a little about that and introduce it. Yeah. Good morning, all. Uh, thank you, Nick, for your introduction. So let me provide you with a few words of context about ESA. Uh, so ESA is an intergovernmental organization but fully independent from the European Union and active in all fields of space. As Nick said, I'm in charge of the telecommunications and downstream applications field, and Nick is heading the department devoted to the, de to the development of new space-based applications and services. The 22 member states uh, of ESA met last November to define the uh, strategic orientations of ESA activities up until 2022. In the field of telecommunications, they defined in particular that space and 5G convergence uh, was a top priority for this three-year period between 2020 and 2022. Therefore, we are delighted to cooperate with DCMS and the UK Space Agency to support the emergence of commercially sustainable application and services enabled by the deployment of converged 5G terrestrial and satellite networks. Today, we are here to launch this announcement of opportunity dedicated to space and 5G convergence in the field of transport and logistics. In fact, this marks an important milestone in the cooperation between ESA and DCMS. So with this announcement of opportunity, we are at fostering the development of new applications of space, 
but which will meet three high-level requirements. One is socioeconomic impact. The second one is indeed to demonstrate the conversions between space and non-space networks. And finally, we want to support uh, applications with a lot of innovation. So let me come back to the three, uh, these three requirements. We aim at developing applications which will deliver a high socioeconomic impact. That means creating high value for citizens and businesses. And I think this is even more important today, whilst we are still struggling with the pandemic, societal and economic consequences. This announcement of opportunity offers the possibility to promote the convergence of 5G terrestrial and satellite networks. And this is the second criterion, which is quite important to us. And by engaging in 5G integrated, so satellite and terrestrial pilots, so this announcement of opportunity provides you with a possibility to uh, show the market pool required to validate and endorse these hybrid 5G solutions. Finally, the projects under this call for proposals should address the, indeed, the uh, transport and logistics uh, domain, but with innovative user-driven solutions. So not only showcasing the convergence of 5G satellite and terrestrial networks, but also including new technologies such as uh, Internet of Things, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, and you may name it. Our role as ESA is to actively support the suppliers of our member states, which come to us and propose those innovative solutions which they want to pursue and introduce into the markets. In other words, the initiative is yours. And we trust that the European industry will be able to exploit at best space capabilities or help the transport and logistics sectors but providing answers and tailored solutions to the needs of this sector. Again, user-driven, this is a user-driven approach. With this, I can stop here and leave the floor to the next speaker. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Magali. Uh, now, as uh, those of you who are familiar with ESA may be aware, um, we are mostly supported financially through uh, contributions from our member states. And Magali mentioned the Ministerial Council last year, where those budgets were uh, re-announced and refreshed. Uh, the UK in particular has been a very strong supporter, both in applications and in telecommunications, and is uh, supporting us in this uh, 5G activity. So we're joined today by uh, Mike Rudd. Uh, who's the head of the telecommunications strategy at the UK Space Agency, uh, who are our partners in this endeavour. So, Mike, uh, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about why the UK has a strong interest in this and what you're hoping to get from it. Uh, yes. Thank you, Nick. Um, and thank you, Magali, for your, for your introduction. It's... Uh, it's a, it's a really uh, interesting call, I think, this one. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning um, for what I hope will be an interesting webinar and, and a fascinating call. So as Nick says, I'm Mike Rudd. I'm the head of telecommunications strategy in the UK Space Agency. And I'm one of the UK delegates to the European Space Agency. For those of you who aren't aware, UK was a founding member of ESA back in the 70s. And I sit as a delegate on the Joint Communication Board, which is as Magali's already explained, concerned with satellite telecommunications and applications. And I'm really excited about the potential here to work with industry, ESA, and across government to meet some of the challenges presented by what we see now as a digital world head on. As we move towards new 5G standards, we need to focus on meeting people's needs and to meet those in an environment where connectivity is key. We need to make sure that that connectivity is available to meet those needs. It's clear that we need a mixed economy of infrastructures to meet that ever increasing demand and make sure people can stay connected all the time. One of the problems that we have, not just in the UK, but globally, is that connectivity is increasingly needed where population is much lower. 
and it makes it increasingly expensive to deliver. It's also increasingly needed where people are not, and the development of some of the things that Magley's already mentioned, such as the Internet of Things, mass and full automation, and the increased use of robotics are seeing the demand for connectivity grow outside urban areas. I think space is well placed to support new converged networks as it's the, got the ability to lay down coverage economically and with the increase in low earth orbit constellations providing high bandwidth is able to support much more than just pack, backhaul as part of a multimodal and converged network. But the challenge as Magali's already outlined, is much wider than just infrastructure. To meet people's needs, we need to meet the use cases on a sustainable basis to address societal challenges and grow the economy. And we've chosen logistics as a pilot topic, as it's a strong basis on which we can encourage innovative, sustainable services that will deliver real benefit. I think we've all seen over the last few months just how important logistics is in the UK and the problems that we have when there's a surge in demand for goods and when the logistics chain is overwhelmed or breaks down. We've also seen dramatic changes in people's behaviours which have been forced by the COVID situation and this has accelerated change massively to society and how businesses operate that would have otherwise evolved over the next decade or so. As someone who lives in rural Wiltshire and has only been um, more than two miles away from home twice since February, I really see the benefit of accelerating um, the, the, the benefits to logistics and the logistics chain and embedding the changes that we've seen um, through the pandemic into, into the way that we operate as society. So as you've probably seen from the, from the uh, web page, you know, the focus of this call is on absolutely on innovation in using the space and terrestrial assets to deliver the 5G connectivity, but also, as Magali pointed out, in that market pool, developing innovative and sustainable applications that we can use in the logistics market that can help solve some of the problems that we've seen recently and move, um, move logistics onto um, a, a, a much more um, sustainable footing using the environment that we live in. So this is the first ever collaboration with DCMS, UK and ESA, and I am really, really pleased to be part of this call. The UK sector is strong in an, UK space sector, apologies, is strong in a number of areas, but as I'm sure you know, space by its nature is international, and calls like these give us the ability to draw on innovation from 22 nations to provide benefit back into the UK. It's also great to see such a broad representation of countries and businesses on this webinar. We're keen that this isn't just focused on traditional space companies, and I'm really looking forward to seeing some amazing ideas and proposals being put forward for anyone interested in meeting this challenge. So thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and the third of our, our three introductory speakers, then, if I uh, can introduce to you uh, Mike Short. Uh, now, Mike, it seems to me only yesterday that we were discussing the, the possibilities of 4G and LTE towards smart cities. And before that, uh, uh, Mike has uh, been involved all the way back to, to, uh, to, to the 2G, uh, 2G, 3G. Um, former chair of the GSMA and Mobile Data uh, Association, former uh, vice president of Telefonica, um, and is now the chief scientific advisor for the Department of uh, International Trade uh, in the UK. So uh, a richness of experience, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing your, expect, uh, your, your uh, perspectives on, on how this is now moving forward. Uh, over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you also for the invitation to take part today. Uh, I'm going to draw more on my experience in telecommunications than my role as Chief Scientific Advisor, but maybe just a few words on that uh, first. So I'm one of the CSAs in the UK government that uh, supports science and technical advice. Uh, very pleased to bring my uh, digital and telecoms knowledge to government today. But I chose to join government after 30 years in telecoms because I felt I could make a difference in terms of helping the UK government represent itself internationally whether it be for exports or inward investment. That's not the nature of this call, even if that may become a byproduct eventually. 
Uh, to me, I'd like to just emphasize the importance of this call now. So in the world of mobile, which I've grown up in for 30 years, I can actually go back to the analog first generation days as opposed to just 2G and GSM. Uh, but, but actually, the world of mobile, I think we've looked at from the principle of volume, value, and variety. In terms of volume, we can see potentially over a, a billion uh, customers using 5G by 2025 globally. So the prospects internationally of handling something in the 5G area uh, opens up huge opportunities for collaboration between satellite and cellular. But the, the figures of around 1 billion show the sort of volumes we're talking about. And we see also around 1 billion devices being shipped every year. But I think the second V I, I tend to use is variety. Uh, and, and that really talks about the variety of applications. And we've seen a real boom in the last 20 years in terms of applications delivered from the internet in a variety of areas to mobile devices. I think we've also uh, coupled extended coverage indoor with Wi-Fi, the second mode really, if you like, on the terrestrial front. And I think bringing in a third, um, a third mode such as satellite is the most obvious thing to do. Because to extract the maximum value with the volume and the variety, needs to have better international coverage. And one of the key strengths that satellite so obviously has is that broader coverage uh, over the seas, the mountains, maybe the rural areas, and difficult to reach places. Um, satellite and cellular should be natural partners as well as complements. Certainly the idea of satellite coverage reducing the capital expenditure of mobile networks uh, is, is often forgotten. Certainly, satellite can also play a role in backhaul for networks as well. But in terms of this particular call, I think there's huge potential to identify innovation and value where, where, where satellite is a key convergent complement to, to the terrestrial modes and indeed a third mode in itself. In due course, I'm sure we'll see more uh, dual mode terrestrial satellite devices. Uh, I'm sure we'll also see more common app stores that are suitable for both uh, satellite uh, and terrestrial purposes. At the moment, the app stores are really booming in terms of their growth. Some of the streaming applications are really growing fast. But one of the weaknesses of cellular tends to be coverage because of the, the difficulty in actually reaching all parts where people may be moving or living, nonetheless those who are in the transport and logistics fleet, which is the call of, uh, of today's uh, webinar. I think we also have lived with the mantra of anywhere, anytime. So satellite really can really add to that uh, coverage opportunity. But it's got to be cost effective. So some of the innovation needs to address how to add real value to, to what exists. Now, I think there are some capabilities in satellite that need to be better exposed to the terrestrial mobile industry and some capabilities in the reverse direction. So bringing two partners or two modes together to me actually brings all sorts of collaboration opportunities. We shouldn't forget that some of the applications may not be for consumer, they may be for businesses or for governments, and that may mean that we need to think about systems integration and single billing and single distribution support, maybe services uh, integration. We shouldn't forget that also that some of the security aspects should be looked at in combination. And in that area, the UK has got some significant strengths alongside some of the other representative countries. We shouldn't forget also that customer care has to be part of this. So having demonstrators that illustrate how the two modes can work together in a careful and, and protected way for particularly sensitive applications. No one would want data privacy to be broken, for example. So how do you make sure you've got harmonized data privacy for the fleet owners or the logistics owners? However, 5G opens up many new applications. And just to touch on some, certainly I've seen some uh, logistics fleets talk about private networks or dedicated networks. How can they get more tailored services for the fleets that are on the road or the logistics that are on the road? Some of them have to have better identity management and tracking of goods and uh, the services that may occur. So how do you bring in new techniques such as blockchain or AI and machine learning in this area? How can Internet of Things help with the tracking of vehicles uh, alongside our various motorways in Europe or indeed beyond? How can we make sure 
that some of the better fleet management requirements for fuel and energy reduction are all addressed. IoT, Internet of Things, is part of 5G and needs to play a part in this call. And lastly, I think the boom in data. We've seen uh, with COVID how many people are working from home, but actually more and more data and streaming services are emerging every day. And really, satellite and terrestrial in combination should offer huge opportunities when looking at the data analytics space or even the data visualization space and indeed some of the streaming services that may be relevant to transport and logistics. To me, we should also not forget that it's got to be cost effective. So making sure that the, uh, the relatively higher cost of satellite is taken into account and tailored towards the types of customers that are able to pay for higher costs, perhaps than consumers. We can also see that energy needs to be taken into account as we think about the road to net zero and COP26. Um, and lastly, I think we need to think carefully about the devices and how they're kept charged or used in a transport environment. They certainly need to be ruggedized. Uh, in a logistics area, there, there may be also some IoT devices as well. So I think there are huge opportunities, and I would encourage everybody on the call to think about Tall voice, but it seems we may have lost Mike's connection just before he gave us uh, his key point that we should think about. Let's give him just a moment. See if you can reconnect. No, that's unfortunate. Um, so I think we had best move on then, uh, and perhaps we uh, we may get Mike's last thoughts uh, if he manages to rejoin us. Um, so. As, uh, as, as Mike was just uh, just saying then, uh, one of the main things that we need to uh, get right in, in terms of the, the technical layers of 5G and space is the horizontal integration between the satellite capability and the terrestrial, particularly the terrestrial mobile capability. So the satellite operators need to work uh, alongside the, uh, the, the mobile network operators. Uh, and, and, and make sure that there is a seamless integration between those, those two systems. Um, our next speaker then um, is an expert in, in just this area, um, Andy Sutton from uh, from BT, uh, with 20 plus years of experience there um, in, uh, in in this network architecture. He's a principal network architect at, at BT, uh, uh, considering these issues. Um, Andy, can I uh, pass over to you to to present? And uh, Laura, I think we'll drive your slides for you. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, um, and hello. So. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how we use satellite-based mobile backhaul in support of the transport and logistics service delivery, uh, and a particular use case from our deployment in the UK. So, cover the next slide, please. Okay, so we'll uh, quickly review some of the use cases um, and look at some of the deployment scenarios. Before we do that, we'll maybe just spend a moment looking at the typical topology of a mobile network. Um, so the network uh, I work on today, BT's network at EE, uh, we support 2G, 3G, 4G, and now 5G uh, radio access networks. And we use satellite for a number of use cases, including increased geographical coverage. It's absolutely vital to transport and logistics because that really does enable coverage uh, from the terrestrial infrastructure for the use of mass market devices uh, that may want to be deployed for a number of transport and logistic use cases. So that kind of helps the kind of economies of scale. Um, but it's actually vital that we have that space component to enable that rollout to happen. But additionally, in those sectors, availability or reliability is absolutely critical. And again, there's a, a very prominent use case in our network where we use satellite to back up terrestrial transmission, and that enhances the overall availability of the services we can offer to certain market segments. So the next slide, please. Okay, if you can just click a couple of times, there's a bit of a build on this slide, and I'll, I'll talk through it. So, uh, thank you. A typical mobile network um, would generally have a, a number of sites connected on optical fiber, and the fiber would generally connect out to a typical cell site. If you couldn't deliver a fiber link, uh, or commercially it wasn't viable in your market, then you may deploy a microwave or even millimeter wave radio system, depending upon the capacity you're trying to deliver. And then 
the architecture could develop towards the model at the bottom there, where actually a fiber-based cell site becomes an aggregation hub. And that aggregation hub then supports a number of subtended sites. Now, the bottom topology is particularly interesting when we think about transport and logistics, because effectively you have one fiber connection and then two single microwave radio hops supporting three sites. So three sites could offer a large geographical coverage, let's say along a, a major motorway, or even potentially into an urban area where there's very little, a uh, 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 rural area, sorry, into a rural area where there's very little overlapping coverage. So we have to think about how we maintain availability and performance uh, within this particular topology. So on the next slide, we'll start to explore how we use satellite to enhance the performance here. You can see an example of, uh, of one of our installations there on the right-hand side. So we've got the fiber aggregation node. That's generally high availability. So that'll have lots of resilience, lots of backup power, uh, multiple transmission routes out of that node itself. But once we get out to the cell sites, then of course we tend to find less resilience uh, within the actual design itself. So this is a very common topology. It does introduce a number of technical challenges around capacity management and network availability. So the question we had to answer was, where should we best place our VSAT capability uh, for that space segment to allow us to minimize the probability of uh, network service affecting outage in the event of a failure of the terrestrial transmission? And if you click to the next slide, please. And again, yeah, to build perfect. So you can see here as the, the traffic grows, uh, as we went towards the aggregation site there, and then we can see what happens in the event of a failure. So in the event of a failure, we've actually deployed the uh, satellite backup onto the site that's illustrated, so the child site or subtended site from the main hub. And the reason we didn't go for the fiber site uh, was, of course, if uh, the microwave link failed, you would isolate the two sites behind it. By actually going for this particular solution, if we lost the fiber to the aggregation node, we could turn all of the traffic around into the cell site that has the satellite backhaul. Obviously, if we lost one of the microwave, then uh, the microwave to the right would continue to work on the fiber, uh, and the two sites on the left would continue to operate. Clearly, there is a scenario where the site to the left could be isolated, and the coverage from that site would be considered in deciding as to whether that had a satellite installation as well. So we've now got a scenario where if we lose terrestrial transmission from a number of different failure scenarios, we switch straight onto, uh, onto satellite, and we can deliver an amount of capability. Now, clearly, the capacity we can deploy on fiber and microwave is significantly higher than we're deploying today on satellite. So we do need to use quality of service. We do need to protect particular types of service. And we heard Mike talking before uh, about certain services which will demand this level of availability and coverage uh, and therefore will be enhanced in this manner. The next slide, please. OK, um, so the system we've deployed. Um, also requires us to develop an on-site synchronization solution. So being able to deliver accurate time and particular time of day phase synchronization over satellite networks is a little challenging today. We're working with a number of partners to develop solutions for that. Um, but certainly for mobile networks, for high performance 4G and 5G networks, not only is frequency synchronization important, but time of day, so phase alignment is also important as well, increasingly as we use more TDD, time division duplex spectrum, and we also utilize more advanced coordination features within the radio access network. And the next slide shows a number of use cases. So in addition to the geographical coverage, which I think is a fairly common use case, We've got the network availability uplift that we've just talked to. But we've also got the ability to deploy rapid um, solutions should we be waiting on a terrestrial solution and which wish to deliver coverage or additional capacity or even some kind of private network solution. Uh, we'll see an example of that in a moment. Disaster recovery is a very common use case along with tactical coverage and special events as well where we may need higher availability of certain services in a certain area to support uh, emergency service activities, for example, in the event of a large festival or even some kind of disaster recovery type event. And the final slide. So in summary, really, uh, you know, BT has a rich history in satellite communications. 
uh, the application of satellite communications to mobile backhaul has been relatively niche until recently. Um, we have uh, in the region of uh, 800 VSAT links deployed in our network now across a range of use cases that we briefly talked to. But actually, recent developments have increased global volumes, uh, but the, the economics still restrict the scale of the opportunity. So as we see more high throughput satellites uh, and more LEO constellations as well, we're really interested to explore the opportunity associated with these to see if we can e make even more use of, uh, uh, of that extremely valuable asset. Um, so terrestrial and satellite backhaul integration enables high availability mobile networking, so ideally suited to the needs of transport and logistics, while offering subscribers you know, the low-cost mass market economies of scale in end devices. So you know, BT's got an ongoing dialogue with the satellite ecosystem. You know, we're investigating some new and exciting opportunities, and, and we're really delighted to be a part of this webinar today, and uh, we look forward to the opportunity to talk to some of you further. So that's my five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. So uh, now that we have the technical capability to integrate terrestrial, mobile, and satellite uh, 5G connections, uh, we have to turn our attention to what are we going to use it for? So who, who wants this? This seamless connectivity, ubiquitous coverage, uh, which is uh, which is going to be become available in this next generation. Um, Today, we're focusing on the, uh, the transport and logistics use cases. Uh, we think these are likely to be one of the, the main drivers from, the, from that demand side, one of the main areas uh, where there's an advantage to bringing satellite into the mix. Um, so I'm very happy now to, uh, to have our next speaker uh, joining us from, uh, from Network, Network Rail. That's, uh, that's Robert Gardner, um, the Senior Innovation Engineer. At, uh, at Network Rail, and who really specializes in this question about how to get satellite connectivity onto both the trains and onto the uh, onto the rail infrastructure. So, uh, Robert, can I pass the mic to you? And uh, uh, let's uh, let's hear your thoughts. Yes, thank you. Can can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, yes, we hear you. That's excellent. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. And and just as you were talking about uh, all that seamless connectivity provided. Uh, from space by satellites, you, you flashed up my picture and, and, and was asking who was interested. And you're absolutely right. We are very interested um, in what uh, satellite connectivity can do for rail. So thank you for putting my image up at exactly the right time. Uh, just, just a quick uh, background to Network Rail. I'm sure most of you know Network Rail is the owner and the infrastructure manager for most of the rail we network in Great Britain. Uh, we're an arm's length uh, public body of the DFT. We don't have shareholders and we invest uh, our income back into the railways again. And you probably know we've got 20,000 miles of track and 30,000 bridges and all, all that good stuff. Um, we, we operate, uh, manage 20 of the largest stations uh, and the others being uh, managed by the train operating companies. Um, I work for the Network Rail Telecoms part of the organization um, that deals with Network Rail's digital connectivity needs. Uh, but we also work very closely with our train operating colleagues uh, such as those in uh, Northern Railway and Scott Rail in particular, but also LNER and others. Uh, and we're here to try to enable connected transport for rail, because it inevitably affects how we develop our infrastructure. So uh, on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I mean, the background to this really, and I've tried to give this a, a logistics focus, but the, I mean, the background really is that satellites communication industry is really undergoing a transformation that we believe could significantly disrupt um, how, we, how we do fixed and wireless communications over the next decade. Um, we're particularly interested in low Earth orbit constellations for various reasons for rail. Uh, we know that there are 15, potentially 15 competing constellations being rolled out globally uh, with very low uh, latency rates and high throughputs. So there's a lot of drivers um, for all of this, uh, the insatiable demand for internet and data connectivity, uh, the miniaturization of satellite technology, the, the launch, uh, the cost of launches coming down, um, electronically steerable flat panel arrays, which are particularly suitable for rail and for LEO constellations, uh, and also a desire by the government to bridge the digital divide as well, because satellites can reach where uh, other parts, uh, fixed networks, and even terrestrial wireless find it a little bit harder to reach. 
Um, so um, we, we are very, very keen to track uh, this technology and see um, what it can do for rail. Um, and uh, we're particularly focused in on um, the, the, the fact that satellite can provide global coverage, and that for us means across our infrastructure, the high, highly reliable coverage. Uh, we're very, very keen on um, how this can integrate with 5G and other non-3GPP terrestrial systems. That's, that's absolutely vital in all of this. And um, uh, we, we're here to explore what, what's going to be possible and try to implement it and, and get it onto the railway network as soon as possible. So in terms of developing the digital logistics ecosystem, as it mentions here, um, and one way of thinking about that is, is, is the physical internet of passengers and freight transport enabled by 5G internet of things and automation. So uh, what, what do we really mean by that? Well, uh, how do we facilitate the efficient transport? Robert, did we lose your microphone there? No voice. Yeah. It seems we are plagued this morning by uh, communication breakdowns and by irony. Uh, I can only apologise for that uh, when uh, Robert can manage to dial back in again and uh, uh, we'll hear the, uh, the, the second half of what he wanted to, to say to us. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, let, let's move on now. I, just point out to you that there's some discussion going on in the chat, uh, uh, which uh, which is very welcome, and uh, we'll we'll bring that back in uh, at, at the pause after after our next speaker, and maybe and I'll invite some of the speakers to to respond to some of those points. So if you have other questions or other discussion points which you would like to pick up from these presentations, then please please do put them in the chat, and uh, and we'll pick them up uh, in in uh, ten minutes or so from now. Um, Does Robert Gardner back? Oh, Robert, you're back. Too late. Yes, I'm very yeah. sorry about the connectivity difficulties here. I, I, I don't normally have any problems at all, but this um, this particular system seems to have some difficulties. Um, we won't blame anyone. Um, I'll carry on from where I left off. So I was really just talking about what is the digital logistics ecosystem, um, and you know, we're, we're interested in how we can potentially, um, you know, how can we track passengers and freight through the system, ethically so? Um, how can we inform, you know, provide information to passengers and freight handling systems? Um, in real time, um, and how can we automate transport logistics uh, reliably and efficient, efficiently? And that's what we mean by the digital logistics ecosystem. This idea of, of passengers and freight being able to flow through our transport networks, a little bit like the way that datagrams pass through the, the internet itself. So that's what we mean by the physical internet. Uh, we'll move on to the next slide, please. I've, I've, I've highlighted a number of um, railway um, applications or railway use cases of satellites, and I've, I've um, highlighted the ones that perhaps are more related to logistics. Um, so here, I'm just going to talk about those to speed things up. Uh, custom information, communications and surveillance systems, uh, onboard trains, um, retail point of sale systems to keep the buffy car stocked, uh, rolling stock condition monitoring systems for keeping an eye on all the systems on board. Uh, and location services as well. Um, track side, also the remote condition monitoring of assets, workforce safety, um, and also connectivity for stations, depots, and other facilities. So imagine if we could could access and process in real time all of the following: you know, the the pr precise status of every train in real time, the the current status of all staff hours and their rostering, the the state of the infrastructure from real time diagnostics. The current performance of all train-borne systems, the, the stock of, importantly, the stock of refresh, refreshments on the buffet, and be able to use and process all of this in real time at the edge or in the network core to help deliver our traffic management systems, which is a, a huge and complex logistics puzzle. Um, so, uh, the, moving on to the next slide. Thank you. So in this slide here, I've really just very, very briefly shown how we see satellite connectivity playing a role in this, uh, this space, going from broadband communications on the left through maybe new LEO constellations such as the OneWeb um, constellation or Starlink or Telesat, um, through to narrowband communications that might be for critical control 
um, all the way through to, to be more into what we might call Internet of Things or sensor uh, communications networks, which are really characterized by low rate, bursty or intermittent uh, traffic. Um, but the idea really, what all of this calls out for is, a, you, know, you, you can use all of these different words to describe it, but converged, integrated, interoperable, incremental, hybrid, um, multi bearer systems, uh, which are both plug and play, scalable, and can deliver the right communication service for the right railway applications. And so, surely that's not a big ask, is it at all? So, uh, last slide, please. I know that's very difficult, by the way, and that's, that's why we're, we're here working on it. So, this is just a, a very basic graphic just to sort of capture what I just said, um, showing how we, we really do need. Um, satellite connectivity play a role in connecting our trains or infrastructure. It will be alongside 3G, 4G, 5G, potentially even high altitude platforms, um, LEO constellations, geo, long, uh, geo um, systems out there in space as well, perhaps even non-3GPP terrestrial wireless such as WiMAX, narrowband WiMAX as well. But really, we need them all to integrate to help us deliver those those use cases, which are related to the the management of our railway network. So, uh, we're here to work with anyone who wants to uh, to to work with us in this space. So, uh, absolutely support this call, and and please do get in touch if uh, if this uh, is of interest to you. Thank you very much. That's great, Robert, and. Uh... Sorry for the interruption. I hope it wasn't on our side. Um, now let's uh, let's press on then. So the last of our the, our expert speakers uh, from the industry side, uh, Jamie Reed, as you see there, <clears throat> uh, director of Satcom and Space Data uh, Platforms at, uh, at CGI. Um, how does CGI see the the opportunity here in these use cases that we're talking about, transport and logistics, Jamie? Thanks a lot, Nick. Um, so uh, thanks for the invitation to speak today. It's, it's a real privilege. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Oh, it's coming through. Yeah, I just wanted to just to give a slight quick background to CGI for those who don't know. So we're a large IT company. Um, we're primarily based in North America and Europe, and we have customers um, in uh, a number of different uh, business sectors, and transport is, is one of them. So if we could go to the next slide. I'm just going to whiz through uh, sort of the, the starts here. Um, so we cover um, communications, transport, and logistics in space. And we're using 5G really as, 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 a, as a mechanism to actually talk to our customers and our, our logo customers in all these different areas and what I, what I've done for this uh, for this call is I've reached out to uh, my colleagues in the particularly in the transport and logistics area and uh, I've asked them what are the key challenges really in their industry and from the messages they're getting from their customers so um, we do an annual survey basically of our customers and we ask them what their challenges are in the industry and how we can help and how we think um, our solutions can help and uh, also what technology challenges do they see in the future. And I thought it'd be useful to present some of those uh, comments back to the group um, because I thought it might help you uh, give you some ideas for proposals and, and really, as Nick suggested, um, give a, a flavour of where we are as a company and our thinking at the moment around transport and logistics, space and 5G. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, and whilst that's changing, um, what I'm going to do is just divide it into two areas. So um, one is uh, logistics uh, and the other one is, is really um, transport. So when I'm talking about logistics, I'm, I'm really talking about freight. Um, we're talking about supply chains, and at the moment, after all, in, 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 the, in the sector, we're seeing an awful lot of consolidation, and, and that's really happening in the last mile, and that was happening last year, and it's still happening. Uber, for example, have just um, bought a big last mile company, uh, well, a smaller company in, in the US, because Uber wants to, to get heavily into last mile deliveries. Um, we've seen FedEx, for example, buying TNT. And, What's happening is these bigger companies are gobbling up the smaller companies um, because uh, they want to increase their reach, um, but they also want to be able to present much more integrated supply chains to their customers. It's what their customers are asking for. 
they're wanting to have greater reach, better visibility into the into the supply chain and also to respond much more quickly to volatility and demand. And we've seen that really in COVID. It's the companies, if you look at the share prices for some of these companies, the ones that have done well in this area, the freight companies and logistics companies that have done well, are the ones that have a very high amount of digitalization. They have really good communication systems um, and they're able to flex their workforce very rapidly to, to, um, to what their customers are asking them to do. Um, and it's that value added service in terms of the unbroken supply chain that we're seeing, I think this year because of COVID, but we've seen this as a trend for a number of years is becoming even more important. So historically, this has been really important for the aviation industry, for example. So here's a, you know, to put this as a picture here, if you're in the aviation industry, supply chain veracity is a top, top priority because you have to be sure that when that spare part goes on a plane, it, it, it's definitely come from the manufacturer and it hasn't been substituted. And in the UK, that's not sometimes that's a problem. But if you go to other parts of the world, the areas of the world where satellites have a huge advantage, uh, the supply chain veracity is, is a life and death matter for some of these organizations. So um, satellites really have a have a role to play in some of these areas to provide this unbroken communications chain um, that enables the people who are managing these supply chains to know exactly where their devices are, where their, where their equipment is at any particular time, but critically to ensure that it's um, authenticated and validated through the supply chain. Because often in, in these uh, multimodal freight processes, you'll have these um, shipments, so they'll be going on, on and off different um, uh, types of, of transport very regularly. It's quite hard to keep track of them. That's now or digitalized that's done through database you know, quite complicated database systems but there's no real-time element to it so these things are checked in and out of ports checked in and out of vehicles for example and there's a real a huge desire in the market for customers to know where their where their stuff is in real time and i think satellites can really have a role to play there even in the uk um, because uh, these things tend to go to the lowest common denominator and if the lowest common denominator is paper, and it often is, that's what they use. Um, and it, what satellite can do is it can help to raise that common denominator. If you can guarantee 100% coverage over an area, then companies will feel much happier about investing in that. So I think the, the new generation of LEO satellites, the new generation of IoT satellites in particular is, is really exciting and could be quite a game changer for some of these organizations. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so the second area I was just going to talk about some of our perspectives on uh, was was the uh, was transport, and I've shown a danger of very uh, a lady who's willing to take a risk here by sticking her head out of a, a train window uh, whilst it's moving. You couldn't do that in the UK, I expect uh, these days, but. Um, you know, we are seeing a, a real strong emphasis on the end user experience. So we're involved in, in the railways, we're involved in aviation, we're involved uh, in cruise shipping, um, and we're seeing that the passenger experience is becoming absolutely critical. And it's a, we, we, one of my colleagues said that for the first time last year, Wi-Fi, good Wi-Fi, got into one of the top five um, decision-making factors for choosing a cruise ship um, for, for, for cruise ship customers. So now good Wi-Fi, is you know, on a par with good food on a cruise ship. <laughs> um, so um, this is the kind of thing that companies are willing to invest in. They're willing to invest in resilience and they're um, willing to invest in uh, robustness to be sure that they can offer this capability to their customers. And coming alongside that, as we're seeing the command and control aspects coming. Um, so whilst there is a lot of tentativeness around autonomy, so autonomous vehicles and so on, and, and maybe that will come, there's a real interest in the command and control for the onboard systems, the remote monitoring, Robert mentioned, um, there's things like making sure the buffet is well stocked, you know, those kind of things, are, are, they're, they're, they're the important stuff for some of these companies, but also in terms of the, the predictive maintenance where they can lower their costs. So we've built a number of different systems which will process this kind of um, data, but really see that adding satellites into the mix will give the level of visibility that these companies are really looking for. Um, so I think I'll just stop there and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Hopefully that will give you a few good ideas and, and very happy to have um, any follow up conversations uh, with you later. 
Thank you, Jamie. That was brilliant. Um, very well. Uh, we've lost a few minutes in our connectivity issues and so on, but nevertheless, I would like to just spend a little bit of time just picking up some of the uh, the questions that our audience have asked through the thread um, and pass those back to our, our presenters. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's start with a, a question which actually came, came in from India, from Skandanambia, um, who's thinking about the impact of uh, rail privatization in, in India. Um, but perhaps more widely than that, and satellite services are inherently global, and the satellites go all the way around, so any service which is, uh, which, which is developed uh, to take advantage of this uh, should be thinking export from the beginning. How do we see in transport and mobility, how do we see the global market potential and the export opportunities? Um, I think the question was originally directed towards you, Jamie, so uh, that's if you have a response. If the others want to come in as well, that's fine. Um, I think in terms of export opportunities, I think it's very it's very strong. You know, the uh, the 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 person who asked the question is absolutely right. With a satellite solution, you can offer same quality of service globally, um, uh, and we see. A, I think the the interesting thing is what we see is that the at the moment the Western markets are, are sort of leading in terms of. IoT, the analytics, all these sorts of things, and they can do that because they deploy them. They've got in most countries they've got a relatively good 4G um, communications network, so they can plug into that. And it's not perfect; it doesn't have full coverage. But I mean, um, you know, the, the types of vehicles that are on the road today have a huge number of sensors and can communicate through those networks in real time. There is a huge demand globally to have those kind of devices. Uh, from a customer perspective and from a business perspective, they see this kind of capability and they want it, but they can't have it because they don't have the same infrastructure. So that's, I think, where, where satellite can come along and say, well, look, you can have the same capability that the, the Western customers and Western businesses have, and we can give you that, and you don't need to wait. You don't need to wait for that infrastructure to come in. And that's that's a huge plus in the export market. Hi, right, it's Andy from BT. I can add a little to that as well. Um, given the pioneering work we've been doing with satellite and satellite backhaul, we've had lots of interest from mobile network operators around the world. So there's lots of other operators interested in understanding how they can use satellite, what the economics are, and what the advantages could be. Increasingly, those mobile network operators have been asked to deliver ever more critical uh, services and therefore both the coverage is important and the resilience angle that we, we talked through during my presentation. If we think also about the global reach of 3GPP technologies now as well as the satellite coverage, then there's initiatives like the integrated access and backhaul work that's ongoing in 3GPP. You know, could that be a technical solution for integrating the requirements of a mobile network with satellites more effectively? So I think there's a lot of opportunity and there's certainly a lot of demand and interest. Okay, thank you both. And there are a couple of discussion points as well, um, talking about the particular characteristics that satellite has from a technical point of view, um, and, and how that might affect the, the, the usefulness in, in different uh, downstream application areas. Uh, let's take them both together then. Um, so the first one is the question of latency and round trip uh, signal delay. And then there is a question about uh, what is the what is the connectivity, particularly in urban environments where uh, which, which might be crowded and have uh, signal transmission issues. So for both of those, uh, how much of an issue is it, and, uh, and and how does it how does it constrain our thinking? Um, I'll, I'll throw that open to the floor. Who wants to uh, address? Yeah, I'm happy to start off. It's Andy from BT. Yeah. Um, so we did a lot of work on the latency um, when we started to use geostationary satellites, and clearly that there is a serious component, the over half a second uh, of latency um, that we have to manage along with then any terrestrial transmission from the Earth station. Um, it does require a level of optimization on the parameters on the radio, so things like radio link timeout parameters, etc., within the actual radio network and the interface between the radio network and the mobile core network. But actually, we found that we can optimize those in such a way that there is no um, noticeable change to the mobility and the way we manage mobility within the terrestrial network. It does sometimes require a little bit of training of the user to understand there is going to be that delay, particularly if you've got a two-way transmission delay up and down and, and back up and down again. Um, so you need to work with partners who are wanting to embrace 
the availability and the additional coverage that can be delivered through the integration with satellite networks and are prepared to understand those challenges. For many of the applications we've looked at, including voice, we found that it's perfectly acceptable. And of course, if we move to more medium Earth orbit and, and particularly low Earth orbit satellites, then that latency comes down considerably. You know, low Earth orbits could be looking at potentially 40 to 50 milliseconds. So again, you know, for the round time trip. So you know, there's a lot more you could start to do and start to optimize with that. But um, for many of the applications, the latency itself is not a problem, and it's something we can optimize around within the network. Okay. Yeah, I just build on what Andy said there. In our experience from the passenger uh, and the transport side, the issue has not really been latency that we've seen, but the issue has been congestion. So uh, for voice, internet browsing, anything except the sort of high high end gaming, um, uh, which people don't generally expect to be able to do on the move anyway, um, passenger mobility is not a problem. But what is a problem is when they sit there and it's just and the wheel spinning because there's no capacity on the link. Okay, right. Thank you for that. Let's uh, let's press on. And uh, there's a couple of questions also about the uh, the, the network architecture. Um, so I'll use some key phrase uh, to, to direct these. Um, do we uh, do we have envisage the possibility of 5G base stations in space? So the satellite becomes a, part, a seamless part of the uh, the mobile infrastructure, and uh, and similarly, question to that: what what are the expectations of mobile ground stations and antennae and so on? Cost? What 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 are we expecting to be spending on on the uh, uh, the, the part of the network which is closer to the user? Two quite different questions, but uh, let's take them together. Um, Nick, this is Antonio here from ESA. Maybe I can take the base station in space question. This is very exciting and sexy question uh, raised from BT. Indeed, this is some of the element which we are currently tackling, and we see more and more interest in uh, distributing uh, 5G architectures between terrestrial and space networks. And in fact, one of our activity in the new uh, 5G work plan is focused specifically in developing solution for base station in space and flying in low orbit um, uh, G-Node-B or E-Node-B, which start, de start demonstrating the functionality uh, and improved effectiveness of, of bringing the complete integration between uh, satellite networks and 5G terrestrial networks. Okay, thanks. And uh, I'm on the cross question. Um, Robert, you're installing these systems on, on trains. Um, what, what does it cost you to do this? The, um, well, what, 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 the way we're looking at it is what does it cost to do it the other way? And uh, that, that, that to, to some extent, gives you the, the, the answer. I mean, whatever you do with terrestrial wireless requires installation of antennas and systems on the train. So in a way, the installation of the uh, equipment on the train for satellite use is is comparable with that, and therefore it's it's cost neutral. But for terrestrial wireless down the, the railway corridors, it can be significant, uh, a very significant expense. Um, some projects we've been involved in, uh, you know, okay, they're pilot projects, trial projects, but you know, figures of hundreds, hundreds of thousands of pounds per mile uh, come up with with these projects because of the need for the power and the fibre and the digging holes and concreting things in and closing the railway line and on and on and on it goes all being done at night of course so it's really it's really more what's the cost of the alternative and the answer is very high I think that, that would be the way to put it excellent that's uh, encouraging us to think about satellite as, uh, as, as, as an option when the, when those costs are high on the terrestrial side. Um, okay, let's uh, let's let's end to move on now. Though, I'll, I'll just I wanted to give the mic back to, uh, uh, to 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 Mike Short though, since you were uh, cut off by your connectivity problem earlier, and we didn't get your your closing thoughts. And in fact, I think you put a question in the thread to yourself about the uh, GSMR uh, migration timetable. So I don't know if that was the closing thought you wanted to add, but. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry for the break in the transmission. Um, I'm not using video now, just in case. Uh, but broadband, I think, really has to be reliable. I, I think the opportunities, though, with this particular call, uh, I, I had already summarized. Uh, so I was coming to a close when I was cut off. Um, I think the opportunities are fantastic in transport and logistics. 
but I think it's got to be based on a real need, which is cost effective and energy and coverage sensitive, adding real value and impact. And thank you for having me on this particular call. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, so you're very welcome, and we're pleased to have you. Uh, very well. Now let's move on to the uh, the call for proposals. We've all been looking at this uh, this slide for a little while, wondering what Antonio and Rita are going to tell us. Um, so let me introduce Antonio. I think he's already spoken, uh, so you recognise his voice already. Um, Antonio Franchi, who is coordinating the 5G activity uh, in ESA. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I have a relatively easy task today. Most of the topics and challenges have already been addressed by the, uh, either by the UK government officials or by the list of distinguished speakers and the, the participants. Which, so I'm delighted to hear that everything which has been discussed is something that at ESA we are trying to address. And as our director Magali mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, Space for 5G is a newly established strategic program uh, set up in ESA after the last year ministerial conference. And its main uh, purpose is to enable precisely the digitalization of industry and society and enable the seamless connectivity, ubiquitous connectivity that Nick uh, talked about. So we, by means of this program, we want to support the integration and convergence of satellite telecommunications and terrestrial networks in 5G. Um, this program cuts across both the upstream technology developments and the downstream application and service developments. So we support industry in topics that we just mentioned before, like building 5G base station in space, uh, how the low Earth orbit and medium Earth orbit constellations enable new and integrated uh, business and services. How, for example, the uh, mobile edge computing could uh, be enabled by satellite, just a topic just mentioned a minute ago, in order for satellite to bring value to the customers by, in certain cases, reducing, reducing the latency by providing the information at the edge of the networks where the user can access them latency free. Uh, and other type of developments where the network uh, technology integration between uh, terrestrial and satellite networks is pushed to the limit thanks to the uh, to embedding space and satellites into the 3GPP 5G set of standards. So we support, a part of, as part of the strategic program, we support uh, the space industry in the standardization of a satellite, part of the family of 5G standards. Uh, whether satellites in uh, geo orbit, Leo orbit, or MIO orbit, uh, each of them can add different attributes and functionalities which cover uh, what we just heard, ubiquitous coverage, resilience, um, capacity offload, even in city centers, for example. Satellite can be very effective in that, provided that there is a convergence and in network integration. And if you see on my little infographics on the right side of the slide, um, the program also addresses all 5G vertical markets. So it explores and challenges uh, industry to provide solutions across the entire range of 5G vertical markets. And today's call on transport and logistics covers a lot of these use cases, whether that is uh, by means of aviation, smart airports, logistics, or indeed smart ports, or uh, uh, the digitalizing and revolutionizing the logistics value chain across the various segments, whether it's sea, land, or air. Uh, it covers a wide variety of range, and that's where space and the integration of satellite with 5G networks offers uh, a lot. So for me, this call today is about three words. I think this uh, won't come to a big surprise to you. These have been mentioned throughout the webinar. The three words are convergence, innovation, and sustainable service. Convergence is about the convergence of networks, uh, terrestrial satellite, to meet, in this case, the UK requirements for the logistics sector, but more widely to meet, to meet logistics sector requirements worldwide and enable the industry to provide solutions. Innovation, uh, it, there is an element of innovation required to tackle some of the challenges which have been listed before, whether the challenge is technical, whether there is cost, or whether it is uh, uh, piloting and demonstrating the effect, effectiveness of these integrated solutions. Uh, a lot of innovation is required from technology point of view, value chain point of view, business models point of view. 
And that brings me to the last keyword, which is sustainability. We look for a creative, uh, forward-looking proposal, which not only demonstrate the technology, but actually uh, validate the sustainable commercial service, in this case focusing on logistics in the UK, so that the right technical integrated solution uh, is put in place with innovation, but with a sustainable service where the networks get deployed, where the hybrid converge solution gets deployed in a, in a business-like fashion, in a commercialized way, where there is a positive business case, both for the operators of the services, but also for the, of the networks, but also for the operators of the uh, logistic services. So, in conclude, to conclude, I am extremely pleased to uh, host this uh, spe spe special call on logistics in the UK focus as part of this strategic program line, 5G strategic program line, and uh, particularly pleased to work in this case, certainly with the UK Space Agency, but also in a more innovative way with the DCMS, and to stimulate the UK European industry to develop technology uh, and pilot services which meet these three criteria of network convergence, innovation, and sustainable services. So thank you very much. We look very much forward to all the proposals coming from industry and, and working with uh, all UK and European suppliers to develop the innovative solutions. Thanks, Antonio. Uh, and can I now also introduce Rita Renato, uh, who is the, uh, uh, the, the head of our partner-led and thematic uh, initiatives uh, in the space solutions area of ESA. So here we're thinking about the demand side and the use cases. Uh, Rita, I think you're going to tell us now about the core. Yes, exactly. Thanks, uh, Nick. So as a last intervention of today, if you uh, get interested, uh, let's say, by the interventions of the previous speaker uh, about this call and this opportunity, I have a few slides. Uh, <clears throat> that in a few minutes will uh, uh, lead you through the main uh, points uh, related to this call. I think uh, the messages around uh, sustainability and uh, innovation were already uh, mentioned by the previous speakers. What we look at uh, is uh, proposals that relate to demonstration projects. So we are not talking about paper studies. We really look into um, proposals uh, where uh, that put forward the development uh, of services uh, and the pilot of those services uh, in the area of logistics. This course is based, uh, uh, as introduced by Antonio, on a memorandum of intent that was signed between ESA and the DCMS uh, uh, some time ago, in 2019, and uh, we took some time in defining uh, different use cases, and we finally chose the sector of logistics because of the transformation uh, that the sector is undertaking and because of the inclination of this sector to use uh, advanced communication system but as well as other technology we think that the moment and the sector is uh, the right one to start showcasing the convergence between 5g terrestrial and satellite and this is the third uh, keyword so uh, what is a clear demonstration project how converged 5G and terrestrial and satellite communication networks should be brought into the proposal uh, together with the innovation and sustainable business models. Uh, why? I think the previous speakers addressed already uh, the different challenges that the sector uh, it has, uh, has uh, uh, now. Um, I have tried to summarize them in, again in three words. So to look into uh, additional efficiency, additional competitiveness of the sector, and of course also reducing the environmental footprint. If we could uh, go to the next slide. Can we move to the next slide, please? All right, thank you. Um, what we are looking for as a requirements into the proposal. So we look about uh, uh, services uh, that uh, 
are showcased with the pilots in the UK, addressing the needs of the UK user communities. Of course, there could be additional pilots um, planned in other countries whether, when this uh, strengthens the business case of the um, team, of the bidder team. So it could be even outside Europe or connecting, for example, UK ports uh, with uh, other ports in Europe. So this could be free to be proposed by the team because uh, let's remember that uh, ultimately we look for sustainable uh, services. So it's uh, the, the team proposing their business case, their business idea, their service, and uh, uh, therefore proposing any demonstration and engagement with any user communities that they think uh, are needed in order to pursue that idea. In order to uh, um, do this, of course, we will look also to have in the proposal the commitment of such a user community, UK-based, first of all, but also uh, from other geographies, if the, the, the team proposes also other, uh, in addition, other pilots that belong to the logistics sector. And for logistics sector, we look really into uh, a very broad scope, so land, air, and, uh, and maritime. Of course, we heard today a lot of examples, a lot of challenges, but again, ultimately, it will be up to the team to define which um, business case, which idea that could address, of course, just a very niche market sector, as well as, for example, intermodal freight transport, so very broad across all the um, transport modes. So this will be judged in its own merit according to the evaluation criteria that will look at the business case, that will look at the innovation, that will look at the utilization of uh, converged uh, networks. Uh, one key element uh, in order to ensure sustainability and then in order to ensure that uh, the service will be then rolled out uh, after completion of the demonstration project is uh, the service provision aspects. So we will look uh, at, actually we have included as key acceptance factor, the need of having a service provider with a leading role within the team. Uh, and this uh, is uh, closely linked uh, with the uh, ambition that we have uh, of really not just delivering R&D, but uh, delivering innovation and sustainability at the same time. The other uh, requirements uh, will be to um, ensure to have agreements in place with the 5G infra infrastructure provider, both on the satellite side and the terrestrial side. And again, this is closely linked to the need of sh showcasing the convergence of the network. Uh, this uh, call uh, is uh, mainly about development of end-to-end -end services. However, we want to push us on the innovation side, and therefore we recognize that there may be cases where innovation is into the different integration of infrastructure, and there is no need to develop new infrastructure. There may be other cases where technology and product development are required, and therefore you are welcome to put this in the proposal as well, because under the 5G strategy program line, as uh, Antonio uh, has uh, shown before, we could cover both uh, services development as well as uh, technology development. If you could go to the following slide and the last one. Right. So how to apply? Um, the companies that can apply can uh, belong to any of the ESA member states that have, uh, uh, they are, have subscribed to the 5G strategic program line of the ARTES 4.0 program. Of course, the participation and the uh, price uh, quoted uh, by any company will be uh, will uh, have uh, to be supported uh, by a dedicated letter of authorization issued by the relevant national delegation. 
ESA will fund, uh, in general, up to 50% of, of the project cost, so we, this is a co-funded project. SMEs, uh, in agreement uh, with uh, their uh, national delegation, can be funded up to 80%. Of course, we advise you, uh, when thinking about the proposal and uh, when you have an idea about the proposal that you want to put forward, to get in touch as soon as possible with your national delegation to discuss this, and actually is mandatory to uh, deliver the outline proposal to the national delegation uh, first uh, before uh, sending it to ESA. The opening date of the call uh, is today, so you will find uh, later in the afternoon uh, the call open and uh, will be open until mid-December. And the proposal will be assessed on a first in, a first out, uh, uh, let's say, basis, but there is uh, no uh, pre-allocated budget so far. And there is also no, um, let's say, cost cap to any uh, specific proposal. So the, propo the costing of the proposal will be uh, assessed in conjunction with the activities proposed in order to evaluate if this is commensurate and uh, uh, fair in order to undertake those activities. You have in the slide the link that was also shared uh, in the chat. And uh, of course, if you have any, uh, I encourage you to, to look at the link where you can find them many more information and uh, if you have any question of course uh, we are available to respond thank you Rita and I anticipate that there will be a few questions from uh, from our audience uh, and I invite you please to to add those into the chat uh, and we will uh, uh, we'll discuss them now with our with our other panelists uh, when we looked at the registrations for this event we see that you have come uh, from 33 different countries, I counted, <clears throat> including 18 of the, the ESA member states. Um, but uh, a large proportion of, uh, are from UK, and uh, we've had UK uh, speakers this morning. Um, eligibility, as, as Rita says, is across many countries. Um, can I invite uh, our partners in sponsoring this, uh, this call from UK side? Um, Emily Gravestock, whose photo you see there in the in the middle, is the head of application strategy. We heard from her colleague Mike Rudd uh, earlier in the in the call. Hello, Emily. Are you with us? Uh, so as Nick said, I head up the applications division, so that means I look after uh, what we can do with all space data when Mike and his team have dealt with the clever stuff. And following on from Rita's remarks. My focus really is on commercialization and sustainability of these projects. So not just projects for projects sake, but projects that will deliver products and services that can be adopted in a sustainable and integrated manner over the long term. And just to uh, compliment what Rita has just said on the proposal, uh, we have actually allocated in the last week uh, an amount of money and we've got about five million allocated to this uh, call at the moment um, for the first batch of proposals that come through. And that's for you. Um, and Mohammed, Mohammed Lali, uh, joining us from the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. And I remember a small celebration when digital was added to the uh, the title of the department uh, a few years back. Um, Mohammed uh, heads across government and uh, international coordination activity, and particularly the activity around 5G testbeds. Uh, Mohammed, welcome. Thank you, Nick, and thank you everyone else uh, for the presentations as well as some of the uh, questions that were proposed by the the audience um, from a from a wider uh, HMG perspective, and in particular DCMS, uh, we're quite keen to see this through in terms of not just developing uh, new applications and use cases, but over and over again today, you've heard about the sustainability and the new commercial business models that will emerge uh, from the trials. And I think that's quite key for the applicants um, to propose such solutions that not only meet just uh, the, the requirements uh, of the of the competition, but also how can we uh, foresee the the trials taking place in a more uh, evolved, um, perhaps a more evolved scenario. Um, and I think one of the things that sort of caught my attention earlier today was uh, the conversation around um, whether the participants or whether the speakers that spoke earlier would be interested in participating. And I think it goes to goes with a saying, really. Um, they chose to to speak, and because of their interest in this, um, and because of the the wider sort of uh, strategy that they have in place uh, as businesses, whether it's Network Rail, CGI, they form a part of the wider UK PLC 
uh, community and ecosystem. So systems integration is necessary. We need the, the likes of satellite telecoms companies and the terrestrial telecoms companies to, to work together on this. We, we recognize the sort of need for freight and logistics, those who move by rail, sea, uh, or road, or air uh, to participate as well. Because there are some challenges, some of the questions that were raised from uh, the participants, uh, as well as those that were raised from some of the speakers as well, uh, require the ecosystem to work together to, to solve some of those challenges. But I think we're, we're open to questions and answers uh, now. That's marvelous. So uh, you have the, the, the three uh, panelists pictures on your your screen so if you but let me know as you put your comments into the uh, in, into the chat uh, perhaps if you're directing towards one in particular or to the, the floor in general but let's start with a general question um, thank you to, to Renato for, for asking the perfect introduction what is what does success look like what is good from the point of view of the uh, the different agencies ministries involved in this uh, who will start Emily I think for the UK Space Agency, good looks like that absolutely integrated piece between terrestrial and satellite, with satellite being more than just black hole, but providing that ubiquitous connectivity to meet some requirements that people will actually want and that we can actually uh, make a difference to the end users and the customers who want to buy this service and, and use it to deliver different services in different locations. And I was really pleased to have uh, some end users on the call today, such as Network Rail, to hear a bit about what they would like uh, to use this for. So if we can get those different opportunities working together in a seamless manner, then for me, I think that is what success looks like. And Mohammed, you've chosen to partner with us on this. Uh, as you pointed out, this is uh, uh, an, an exceptional thing. So uh, why did you do that? What, what are you looking for out of this and what's, what's good for you? From a, from a DCMS perspective and from a test beds and trials perspective, um, the UK has injected about 200 million pounds into 5G terrestrial trials uh, to date uh, across the UK, ranging from a, a variety of use cases, everything from salmon farming in the Orkney Islands to uh, smart sensors on wind farms to uh, tourism bath in Bath and Bristol to connected vehicles. There's a range of applications and services. From, from our perspective, logistics plays a large role in delivering goods, uh, both from an end-to-end -end, uh, range, but also the last mile. And there are challenges, uh, as the speakers had mentioned. So what does good look like to us is whether um, this user community can use some of the investments that we've made to date already in the UK, uh, utilize the ecosystem that we've built through uh, UK5G.org, uh, a network organization that exists in the UK, utilizing that sort of existing um, funding to apply for new interventions that take into uh, account the convergence, that take into account the positive nature of, of uh, SAT comms, uh, SAT imaging, as well as geospatial locations. How do those sort of technologies work together uh, to supplement and further the objectives of the the sector, um, and that's and that's the in essence what good looks like from our lens. And Rita, yes, thanks, Nick. Yes, uh, well, from ESA point of view, uh, we are a European Space Agency. From our point of view, I think that uh, good is uh, uh, to see that there are uh, uh, successful uh, um, and sustainable uh, uh, services that use space, and in this case, uh, particularly uh, satellite communication uh, integrated in a converged network with terrestrial communication using uh, the, the ultimate, I would say, uh, 5G um, uh, technology and uh, infrastructure uh, that uh, really find their way to be accepted by the user communities. Uh, that find their way in the market, uh, that uh, find the funding to move uh, from uh, R&D to uh, really delivering uh, business uh, and being used uh, on an operational manner. I think this is uh, what we would uh, consider good. Good. I hope 
that uh, that is driving the thinking of the people who are thinking of uh, uh, applying to the the call now. We had a few questions coming through about uh, the eligibility and the shape of the projects which we uh, which we expect here. So maybe Rita, we stay with you for those. Uh, yeah. Is there a maximum project length, uh, a minimum project cost, uh, and what uh, what might the involvement of universities be? Yes, um, so there is no uh, predefined uh, length or duration uh, of the project. So uh, in this uh, respect, uh, you may uh, put forward uh, the proposal that you think uh, is uh, adequate uh, to develop uh, the uh, service, eventually the technology, and demonstrate it through a pilot. Typically, we know that uh, the pilot, uh, in order to have, uh, let's say, an impact and to receive the feedback of the users, to be, to be able to elaborate on those feedback and deliver a uh, ready to be rolled out product or service uh, should not be less than six months. But of course, we are flexible and we are ready to uh, take your proposal and discuss also with you why uh, you have proposed less or a very long period, for instance. So this is uh, flexible and up to you to define. In relation to the project cost, uh, I said before there is no maximum, there is also no minimum. Also, again, this is uh, an invitation to you to put forward what you need to develop, what you need to do, and to, to uh, demonstrate it. And uh, we will assess your proposal. Actually, first at the level of outline proposal, you will see when you visit the um, how to apply page. And secondly, your full proposal, so where you will have really to go through all the details that are required in order to assess schedule, work package, task, activity, and costing associated. In relation to the, oh, sorry. Uh, the last question I had is related to the university participation. Yes, university and research institutes are entitled to apply. These are demonstration projects, so uh, there are uh, specific uh, implementing rules uh, that will apply in relation to the co-funding. So uh, please visit the, the, the web page to get uh, all the, the, say, the numbers, <laughs> and uh, because this depends also on which activity the university will undertake, whether in the technology development or in the more, let's say, service development area. Thank you. And then uh, a question which I held back about the eligibility, because I think it goes to everybody, uh, which is about the nationality and the geography attached to this. Um, so uh, what is the particularly strong role of UK in this call? And then what is the eligibility uh, across other countries? We had a particular question whether someone can join from Turkey. Uh, Rita, maybe you take the, the Turkey yes. question. And yes, then we go I okay. Yeah, uh, so in, uh, um, uh, as it was in the slides, the call uh, is open to uh, companies from ESA member states uh, that uh, are subscribed uh, to the, the have subscribed, so have allocated funding to the 5G strategic program line, and therefore Turkey does not, uh, uh, let's say, belong to this, uh, to this set of, com of companies and as such. Uh, therefore, no, there is no enticement to apply. Of course, you can always apply, well, there is no entitlement to receive funding, but you can, of course, apply with a team and support a consortia, even a subcontractor, without uh, uh, requesting funding to ESA. Thank you. And the, the, the question about the, uh, the, the UK's particularly strong involvement, uh, what, what, what is the form that that takes? So, and Emily Mohammed, can you speak a little bit about the uh, special contribution of UK here? I think from a DCMS perspective, there are, are two areas. One, um, we have a concerted effort to driving the deployment of 5G, both in uh, terrestrial landscapes, but also providing uh, coverage at the same rate. So the government's ambition to connect uh, the large majority of the population by 5G by 2027, alongside the uh, opportunity to provide uh, gigabit capable networks to um, to 95 percent of the population by 2025 and so both go hand in hand in the UK's sort of interest both from a coverage and capacity perspective 
Having said that, what is of interest to the UK in particular and surrounding logistics is that it accounts for 10% of the UK GVA. 10% is quite the large sum for one sector in particular. So that goes to show the importance to the UK PLC. It, uh, the logistics sector also accounts for about 8% of the UK's total workforce. So when we look to responding to some of the challenges that emerge from uh, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, that emerge from our ambitions for uh, coverage and capacity, that emerge from our ambitions for net zero uh, and to get to net zero by 2050, um, logistics plays a large role across the three areas. Uh, whether it's moving uh, freight from point A to point B from urban dense centers to more rural areas or vice versa, whether it's moving things from um, airports or seaports to midtowns to urban centers to rural locations, all of that is the uh, what encompasses our sort of interest. To that degree, I should also point out that we will be working uh, with participants on the call as well as those that uh, were unable to join us for this portion to connect you to other interested parties. And we can do that through uh, multiple mechanisms. One, UK5G.org, as I've previously mentioned, but also there's a larger space community that exists through the, the European Space Agency as well as the UK Space Agency. And I think we'll be looking to put web, some of these webinars together and some of these hopefully take in person as well uh, when the time comes over the course of the year. As, as Rita and as others have mentioned, this will be going on until mid-December, this competition. And so the opportunity to meet partners, to uh, facilitate new relationships and to use existing relationships, um, I think we're quite keen to support that through all three channels. Which is a beautiful answer to the last question that we had on our, our chat thread, which is about uh, finding partners. And equally, if you approach UKSA, you approach ESA, um, we'll provide uh, help with you, uh, help to you in uh, in putting together your your uh, proposals, and we'll provide the guidance that you you need. The uh, the, the links to this uh, activity are already in the chat thread, so uh, if you are interested and you think you have an idea that you might want to put together, then uh, please follow those links and look at our web pages, uh, our ESA web pages. I'm afraid we're out of time now. We're going to have to draw this to a close. I'd like to very much thank our, our expert speakers and our, our partners who've uh, um, provided us with the content and the insights today. I hope you all found it inspiring. I hope you're all now motivated to uh, put your ideas down on paper and, uh, and, and bring them towards you, because we're really looking to, to bring forward space as an element of 5G here, and uh, we see transport and logistics as, as being a, a, a key driver, which is, which is going to be one of the ones that makes that happen. Thank you very much to everybody for joining us. We were over 150 um, people uh, watching this, uh, this webinar, uh, and we thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.